All right, in the interest of time, I'm gonna go ahead and get started here with our introduction. Welcome everyone to CBSA's January virtual presentation, Social Security Disability Application. Before I introduce your, our speaker, I just wanna introduce myself briefly. My name is Debbie Conklin. My involvement with CBSA started with organizing the Run for the Bucket in Wisconsin shortly after my, CB, my son's CBS diagnosis in 2005. In 2007, I joined the CBSA Board of Directors and in 2016, I became the Program Director. So if you've contacted the office recently, you have talked to me. For the duration of the presentation, you'll all be muted. Please do not unmute yourself as the uh, background noise is distracting to both the speaker and those attending. Um, also, we are recording this and it will be on our YouTube channel. So please don't record it um, on your own. It will be available soon. If you're having trouble with your audio, you may consider using your phone instead of using your computer speaker. We have about 150 people on this meeting. Unfortunately, that may mean we don't have quite enough time to get to everyone's questions during the Q&A session, but we will do our best. And as far as the Q&A session goes, you can submit a question at any time during the talk in the chat box, and we will ask the questions at the end. And now for the main attraction, we would like to welcome attorney Dave Hudak. Attorney Dave Hudak graduated from Marquette University with a Bachelor of Science Nursing in 1980 and a law degree from Marquette University in 1987. He combines his experience from working in surgery as a nurse with his legal experience to persuade the Social Security Disability Administration to grant benefits to those in need. Dave is a sustaining member of the National Organization of Social Security Representatives, Wisconsin Bar Association, and the Wisconsin Lawyers Assistance Program. Dave has worked with CVS patients and understands the struggles that those affected by CVS face. One of my favorite things that Dave said in some of the information he sent me is that him and Teresa Ramden um, have been pursuing this dream job together for 25 years. So welcome, Dave. Thank you so much. Happy to be here again. My purpose today is to give you an approach to social security disability that approach means a way to think about whether you're eligible for disability, how to think about the application, and what kind of uh, forms and processes we'll go through. So by the end of this, you should be able to determine if you or your friend is eligible. We're gonna talk about what kind of benefits are available to individuals that receive disability benefits. We're gonna talk about what is disability, how Social Security approaches that subject, how to apply, and then finally, let's talk about some specific questions that you have. So we'll go to the, to the third slide here. We're Social Security Advocates of Wisconsin. Teresa and I have been working together 25 years. All we do is Social Security disability. So that means we talk to a lot of people. Social Security is government work. So that means you can't just kind of reasonably guess what the definitions are or what it means to be disabled. It's a very specific process. So we talk to people all the time, people that are still working and saying, I can't work anymore. I can't take this, what do I do? So we take those calls all the time. I like taking those calls. And that's kind of how I'm doing this presentation is to get a sense of what it means to be disabled under Social Security. So we'll do the initial applications. We'll do the appeals. I do the hearings. Typical judge is doing three or 400 hearings a year. So there's a certain approach to that. We do appeals from hearings and then we even have attorneys that take it to federal court. So let's start in here. What is eligibility? There's two kinds of programs. Social Security Disability Insurance, the one you work for, and Supplemental Security Income SSI, the one because you have little income or assets. So Social Security Disability Insurance you work for, that means you're paying taxes, you're paying that FICA tax, you and your employer are contributing over a period of time 
and then you're eligible for the benefits for SSDI disability. Generally, it says you have to work five out of the last 10 years. So that means you have to be paying into the system taxes, generally five of the last 10 years. That means they just don't work. You actually have to pay taxes. And sometimes we get people who are self-employed that have been working really hard, but don't pay any taxes. After a period of time, you're not going to be eligible for the SSDI program. Other times it comes up where people own, let's say, a small bar or a small business. They're making some money, but they're just not filing taxes. Or for some reason, certain businesses lend themselves to people working but not paying taxes. Um, Self-employed painters work really hard, but sometimes they don't always pay their taxes. I got a good buddy who's a painter, he pays his taxes, but unless you actually pay into the system, you're not gonna be eligible. The other thing too is like self-employed people with a spouse, one, one of the spouses will take the income and the other one doesn't. The spouse that's not getting wages or paying into the system is not eligible. So the spouse is not gonna get social security disability benefits unless the other spouse passes away. So you have to pay into the system to get benefits. And a little bit, we'll talk about what those benefits are. The other program is SSI, Supplemental Security Income. That's if you're poor, if you have little assets. Typically, an individual can have no more than 2,000 of assets, excluding a house and a vehicle. For married couples, it's 3,000. Then they get SSI benefits. So this would apply, for example, someone that turns 18. You can apply for SSI benefits, having turned 18 and living in your parents' home, in a friend's home, relatives. You still may be eligible if your assets are low, you have little income, and are found disabled. So that's, how, that's the two eligibility programs. Sometimes people are eligible for both. So what kind of benefits would you get in Social Security Disability? Why would you even apply? Well, let's talk about the one you work for, the SSDI benefits, also known as DIB, the DIB benefits. Social Security pays you in disability what you would receive at your full retirement age. So full retirement age for most people coming up is 67. There's still some, the full retirement age is 65, a little older towards 66. So disability benefits is the same thing as if you reached your full retirement age. So that's different from your early retirement. Early retirement at 62 would mean that you get a decreased benefit. So let's say your full retirement age is 67. You take early retirement, that's a 30% cut from your full retirement age. On disability, you don't take that cut. You get your full disability amount, which is your full retirement age. So on uh, SSDI, you could still work. Even applying for social security disability, you can still work part-time. Every year that amount goes up a little bit. Currently it's $1,310 in a calendar month. Gross income, 1310 in a calendar month. Prior years, it's been a little less. Last year was 1260. So you don't have to stop working. You just can't work too much. There's also benefits that people around or related to the worker. Like I said, the uh, widow benefits, you can get widow benefits. Um, if you're married at least 10 years, you become disabled, there's some special rules. And also certain children, adult children can get those SSDI benefits off of one of their parents paid into the system. So that's the first part, you get money. The second part is it you're eligible for Medicare. So the two benefits you get are money and 
some kind of health insurance. So the Medicare is the same Medicare you get as if you turn 65. But both of these programs, they make you wait. So they determine your onset date. Your onset date is when you met all the requirements of Social Security disability. So if last year in January 1st, you're technically disabled, under SSDI, you wouldn't get paid for the sixth month. So until June of 2020, you wouldn't get paid. And then two years from June of 2020, then you're eligible for Medicare. So from the onset date of your disability, you have to wait 30 months or 24 months of when the technical date you start getting paid. To decide what your onset date is a little more technical, that's to do with a lot of different factors. But just know that when you apply for Social Security Disability, retroactively, you could recoup up to a year back pay. So if I'm disabled two years ago and I apply now, I can retroactively recoup those prior 12 months, which could be significant. The other benefit, the SSI benefit, it's a fixed amount. The max is about 880 between federal and state. So $880 a month, and it's Medicare like Badger Care. People start on Badger Care before being eligible for SSI because I think the cap now for Badger Care is a little over a thousand a month, maybe a thousand forty dollars a month of any kind of income. So they would get a benefit up to about 880 maximum. But with SSI benefits, there's no re retroactivity. You can't go back in time prior to your application date. It starts the month after your application, if you're found disabled at your application date. And there's no waiting period. There's no children benefits. Now with SSDI, there are children's benefits if you make enough. Once you start getting $1,000, $1,200 a month, they will give you an extra amount for minor children. So for example, if you're getting $1,600 a month on your own, if you have minor children, they're gonna give you a maximum of another 50% or $800 a month, which is significant, of course. And this sometimes come into play about child support and child support or rearage. I don't do that. But Social Security will pay an additional amount of money for children. That's a children's benefit. So those are the, the basics to be eligible and the benefits. So how do you know if you're actually disabled under Social Security rules? So I, I, this is the approach I take. Social Security disability is all about function. Sometimes, but not very often, the diagnosis itself will make you disabled. Most of the time, it's all about function. So social security disability is what you can do. And I like to use this 851 rule, and that is, can you work eight hours a day, five days a week, not missing more than one day a month? So somebody calls me in, and they say I'm disabled, and I say, well, why do you think you're disabled? And then I ask them, can you show up at work on time, five days a week, stay there for eight hours? Can you at least sit? Can you do something? Can you deal with other people? Can you pay attention? Can you deal with work stress? If you can do those things, you're not disabled, generally speaking. So that's, that's pretty straightforward. I'm, I'm not saying that's easy to do that all the time, to show up on time, pay attention, do all with other people. But that's kind of it. That means if you show up to work and can sort the size of walnuts, there's a job like this. Can you sit at a desk and sort the size of walnuts all day? Yep, you're, you're not disabled. But I like that approach because it, it makes you think about function and not necessarily a disease. 
Now, certainly certain, certain kinds of diseases or diagnoses lend themselves to disability. And sometimes there are some objective tests that make it easy to determine if you're disabled. So for example, blindness. If you're 20 over 200 in your better eye, by definition, you're gonna be disabled. You get an eye test, an ophthalmologist or optometrist says this is your acuity, you're disabled, that's pretty straightforward. You can have a heart problem, congestive heart failure. You can have an echocardiogram. And if your ejection fraction is low enough over a period of time, you're disabled by definition. Same thing for lung problems. You get a pulmonary function test. If your breathing is pretty bad and it's objectively documented through a pulmonary function test, you're disabled. Certainly certain kinds of cancer through biopsy, metastasis, that will get you disability. But most of the cases involve attempting to discover what your actual function is. How much can you do things? You have a fusion surgery. That's, you know, it's pretty significant. But Social Security is going to think, well, some people do really well. You might have had two fusions. You might have had a cervical fusion in your neck. You might have had a lumbar fusion on your low back. Some people still go back to work. So it's all about function. So how do you prove function? Well, proof is what people say and what documents show. So documents, of course, are your medical records. So what, what's the first thing you do if you're trying to prove you're disabled? Well, it, it's good to like see medical professionals. You can go in and say, I can't do anything, I can't lift, but unless there's some kind of treatment or evaluation, it's gonna be difficult to prove that. Now, what kind of proof you need kind of depends on your condition, but generally, People have a primary care doctor, and if they have a special condition, they typically have a specialist. So if you have a spine problem, some spine specialist, orthopedic doctor, or neurosurgeon. If you have fibromyalgia, you're going to be seeing a rheumatologist. They're going to perform certain trigger point tests on you and come up with what they believe is a diagnosis and then try to figure out what your function is every day. Getting treatment sometimes is tough, especially this last year. But without some kind of treatment, it's very difficult. And some of the things we do is try to encourage people to see certain kinds of specialists. First thing, of course, is you should see a specialist if you need it for your medical condition, because the number one rule is do whatever it takes to be healthy. Do whatever it takes to be healthy. If you do that, you're going to be fine with your documentation. But specialists are really important. And it's a curious thing that Social Security doesn't really put a lot of weight in my experience with chiropractors. You can have long treatment history. You can have excellent notes, x-rays. But Social Security seems to discount that. The medical model is still in full force that seeing your primary doc, your specialist really helps. When it comes to mental or mood disorders, regular treatment is really important. You can't just have a functional capacity evaluation for your mental conditions, but we do get opinion reports from therapists psychologists, psychiatrists that indicate um, what your functional level is. Early on, the evaluation of social security disability is going to be just, um, just paperwork and the paperwork you fill out, your medical records, things that are said maybe during an interview with Social Security, they're gonna use that to determine if you meet the different technical applications of Social Security disability. 
Can you function? Can you go to work? Can you stay at work? Can you get along with others? When it comes to mental disorders, it really is a lot about socialization, showing up, staying at work, dealing with people, being motivated. Concentration is a real big thing. Can you concentrate for a period of time, even on simple tasks? That is more difficult. Like I said, about 25% of our cases are mental disability cases. Regular treatment is always, always a preferable uh, way to prove your case. The best is a regular treatment through your doctor over a longer period of time. Nowadays, that doesn't seem to be always possible with insurance issues or doctors moving or places closing. But the, in the ideal world, you'd have regular doctor visits. What we do then is we submit a report for a doctor to fill out of a about a functional level. Functional level meaning showing up, staying at work, do you need breaks? Do you have to sit? Can you stand? How much can you lift and carry? Can you get along with people? So we take those forms and we file them. We do, um, I do the hearings too. And hearings are a different approach in terms of uh, the judges. And that is to, to summarize, we summarize all the medical records and file it with the judge. Like I said, judges are doing three to 400 hearings a year. So some of these files, you know, three, 4,000 pages, we read it all and summarize it. So what, is that, what does all this mean to you? First, should you apply? You look at this and say, am I eligible? If I worked enough or am I poor enough? If you can't figure out um, through your statement or from your history, if you're eligible for SSDI, you can go online. I don't know if, uh, how many are familiar with the My Account under Social Security, that's ssa.gov, G-O-V. You go to My Account, M-Y-A-C-C-O-U-N-2, Google those two together you'll get a page where you can open an account that will give you your social security statement that will list all your years of income and it'll stay on they say on there if you're eligible for social security disability at the time you get that report it'll also estimate how much in benefits you're going to get for you and your dependents as to the SSI eligibility, sometimes the only way to figure out if you're eligible is to make an application and that there's a worksheet they go through. It's long and it, it takes a while to go through that. So you just can't tell for sure sometimes, you just have to go ahead and apply. So if you think you're disabled and you're eligible, and you have some medical proof, you certainly can talk to people that do this all the time like us, and we can give you a feel for what the process will be like and how likely it is, or you can ask for help. You can go online and do it yourself with uh, Social Security, the SSA.gov. There's a disability page you can land on. It gives you a checklist of information you need and you can fill that out. Social Security will probably call you, follow up, make sure the information is correct, confirm you're eligible for one of the programs or both, and then they'll process it. You could also make an appointment with Social Security and they have people in the local office that will help you. Remember that these people are not Social Security disability specialists. The local office does not determine whether you're disabled. There's other agencies that do that. So all you're there is to apply with them. And then there's people that will help you. In every county in the state of Wisconsin, we have the ADRC with Health and Human Services, the Aging and Disability Resource Center. They'll do it free. They'll do your applications, they're trained. 
They do not do hearings though. They'll do the first two steps, the application, the reconsideration. They do not do hearings from my experience, um, but they will help you do the application process in the first two steps. The application can be a little tricky. The application can be tricky. Let's just talk about some things that I see a question popping up that applies. The application can be tricky. One is when you apply, like what's making you disabled? Well, my thinking and my approach is, well, you go to work with everything, right? You go to work with your body, your mind, your moods, your mental, everything applies. So anything that has a limitation or restriction on your ability to do what I talked about, eight hours a day, five days a week, not missing more than a day a month, you should put that on the application form. That's what I think, because I'll give you some examples. If you have a cervical fusion on your neck, typically there's other symptoms that go along with that. There's some neuropathy in your hands. You might have significant amount of pain, which affects your concentration. You might become depressed because you can't work. You might be seeing a therapist. All those things come together. But, you know, as life goes on, we all get a, a beat up a little bit. So there's different things. Um, I love talking to these uh, older workers. And when I was seeing them in person, I'd, I'd make them put their hands on the desk. Because I'd, often I'd get these hardworking people they have little tips missing on their fingers or a knuckles go off from some bandsaw accident. Well, that makes a difference with social security. You can't do certain jobs like keyboarding if you're missing part of your finger or they'll have all kinds of significant uh, fusions or surgeries or limitations that go back 15, 20 years. They've been limping around at work, working, but what finally did it is they had a heart problem. Well, with application for social security disability, you really should include it all. And I'm not saying making things up or whining about things. I'm saying if you got legitimate limitations, you should put it on there because that's how you would go to work. The same thing is true with um, mental and mood disorders. A lot of, a lot of hardworking people don't, just don't like to talk about that. But if there's a limitation, anxiety, panic attacks, if it's a legitimate thing that's bothering, it should be put on the application. It is more fuss. It is more work. It's more work for us to get those records and try to get reports from the treating people. I just think it's a more legitimate, comprehensive, authentic way to do it. I tell people all the time, just be yourself. Tell them how it really is. Don't complain. Just tell it how it is. But don't minimize it either. So I think that's a big thing is to list all your impairments on your application. And of course, all your medical treatment. Social Security typically only goes back about a year, but I find often you have to go back significantly further than that. Just talked to a gentleman, he had uh, a significant amount of fusions about 14 years ago. Well, it still makes a difference. He's still bothered by that. The other thing I should talk about with your application for disability, whether you're doing it yourself or having somebody help you, is the onset date. It's a very important date. Onset date means you've technically met all the requirements for Social Security disability. There's some technical requirements. First one is, are you working too much? It's not a hard and fast rule because sometimes you can work too much and it doesn't count. But generally, $1,310 this year. If you're working under that, then you could be disabled. If you're working more than that, you're probably not disabled. The, the second thing is to go back in time enough. You know, I talked earlier about getting benefits, retroactivity of benefits, uh, up to a year in SSDI cases. That's pretty important. That year of uh, past due benefits plus the eligibility for Medicare. Sometimes the date's really tricky though. It's really tricky and it, it takes an analysis to sit down and it also means when your eligibility is and your work history and treatment, it's often the onset date is incorrect. 
it should be back farther. So when, when you fill out a form, you fill it out online. If you do it online or have somebody help you, they'll send you back a form to proof that the information is correct. And then they're gonna have you fill out some forms. One form is your work history form. And that's how you actually did your work in the last 15 years. So back to 2006 going forward, they have to determine whether you can go back and do your past work, makes sense. So they gotta figure out what your work was. So when you fill out that form, it's basically, what job did you have? How did you do it? Now, Social Security knows what jobs you were paid. I mean, they have everything in there. They probably know what I had for breakfast, but they certainly know anytime any employer paid tax for you, they have that listed out by year. But they want you to fill out a form so they can see if you can go back into your past work. It's basic stuff. How much did you sit, stand, walk, bend, twist, turn? How much did you lift and carry? What'd you do to supervise people? It's pretty straightforward. I know some people have 25, 30 jobs. That makes it difficult, but generally it's how you did your work so they can figure it out, whether you can do it now with your conditions. The second form is called an adult function report. Adult function report is, what's it like to be you every day? I, I ask people all the time, how much do you sit down? How much do you lie down? Who asked that question? So you have to think about it. You have to kind of spend several days, maybe a week or more, going through the form and figure out what you're actually able to do. Often people say, well, I can't lift up anything. Well, Social Security says you can lift up something. You can lift up a phone, piece of paper, glass of milk. The big questions are, can you lift like 10 pounds? Gallon milk is eight pounds. Can you lift 20 pounds? Can you lift 50 pounds? Can you walk? How far do you walk? How long can you walk? So the detail is really, really important. And again, it falls on trying to be accurate and actually capture what it's like to be you every day. Nobody likes to hear somebody complaining about everything to the point where it's not believable, but a lot of workers don't complain at all. They don't really like to think about or write down their limitations. So trying to get accurate, often if you get a buddy or a family member or a spouse to help you, they're probably a little more objective on how to do that. When those two forms are filed, Social Security gets records. They're supposed to try to get all the records. And from there, they will evaluate it and give you a decision. That first decision is four, five, six months. It's a little choppy now with COVID, sometimes quicker, sometimes longer. After you get your first denial, there's an appeal process called reconsideration. So we file out recon. That takes another three to five months, depends, could be quicker. They deny you again, then you can appeal before an administrative law judge. Most people are saying you should probably have somebody help you. It's tricky. It's tricky. Um, it's tricky. The old saying is, don't tell me what the law is. Tell me who the judge is. Because judges have their own methodology. And if you're in front of them 15, 20 times, I kind of get a feel of what they're like. How tight are they? What do they rely on? What kind of questions they ask? It makes a difference. I mean, some approval ratings by judges are 20 out of 100. Some are 60 out of 100 approving. So it makes a big difference who your judge is. The other thing is that a hearing, Social Security is not going to be getting your records after you file a request for hearing. You got to be supplying those records. And even if they help you, my experience is, you have to pay attention to your own case. We have to pay attention to our own cases to get information. One of the big steps is to always get everything. And nowadays, it, it's tough. It's tough to get records sometimes. You would think it'd be pretty straightforward. We get them all electronically. We're, we're all digital. We can file them electronically. But for someone just walking into the system now, the healthcare delivery system trying to get records, sometimes it's choppy. And like I said, a lot of them are doing it electronically. 
which is great for us, but for the average individual that's not familiar with it, it's a bit more daunting. It's tough. There are other reports that can be filed. Um, but overall, the approach is this. If you think you're disabled, you have to be persistent, polite, and thorough. There's so many specific little traps and uh, details with Social Security. Generally, it goes fine for a lot of people going through it. But by the time I reach a hearing again, and we do pick up a significant amount of cases from other people and lawyers, even after hearings, to evaluate. And I'd say the number one thing is not listing all the impairments. Two, not getting all the records. Three, not reading everything. And fourth is not talking to people. So it, you have to talk with your lawyer, wherever's helping you, ADRC. Talk with them so they know what your situation actually is. It's amazing what I can find by talking to people. It's prepping people, getting ready for hearings. It's amazing what I can find. And the details are so important. So I've tried to avoid the technical stuff of Social Security. Generally, think about whether you're eligible, whether you can go to work, start the process, be persistent, and call somebody for help. The Social Security offices, like I said, are, you know, they're doing retirement, they're doing um, survivorship benefits, they're doing disability. So the people that answer the phone are not specialists in disability. Sometimes they help. But your disability case is pretty important. So don't, don't be afraid to reach out. So we, we do a state of Wisconsin, but there are national organizations you can contact to get referrals. You know, people call us and we refer them to uh, people in other states that are part of the national organization. That national organization is, is NASCAR, N-O-S-S-C-R, the National Organization of Social Security Claims Representatives. Only a bunch of lawyers would think of that name, NASCAR. National Organization of Social Security Claimants Representatives. They have another, you can get on their website. They have a number of the, uh, they'll refer to you people in their organization that are local to you. I always encourage people to get somebody local. That's because I think it's really important to know your judges, know the people in the local offices, know your healthcare providers to get records. Um, that's just our approach. I'd rather know these people and deal with them so I can find things and ask questions and convince them so they know us, they trust us. But there's so much to talk about in social security disability, but I think I've talked enough. Let's, let's run through some questions and see if I can help out. Thank you, Dave. I think a lot of the information you already provided was very helpful. Um, I'm gonna try not to ask the questions that you already covered, but I may, sometimes it's good to hear information twice. Um, the first question was, if someone's CBS is under control, would they still be eligible for social security? Excellent. So I go back to my definition of what it's like to be disabled is, can you go to work eight hours a day, five days a week, not missing more than one day a month? So under control, it sounds like their symptoms are not preventing them from everyday activities. So I would say it'd be difficult in that because you'd have to show what, how would that interfere with your ability to go to work? Typically with, um, with cyclic, you're experiencing days or periods during the day where you're not going to be able to do anything, where you're going to be incapacitated. That would make you disabled. But if you have it under control with treatment, uh, there is no definition of disability there. Perfect. Thank you. Um, someone's asking about if this only applies to the states and they're in Canada. So do you have any ideas of resources for people in other countries? Yeah, there's, there's special rules about that. 
that I that you have to look up the specific country. I think Canada is one of you could still receive benefits in Canada if you've paid into the Social Security disability system in the United States. But there are special rules. It's complicated. I've done it a couple times. Um, you can go on the Social Security website and they'll tell you what countries you're eligible for. Uh, but you have to have enough eligibility credits in the Social Security system in the United States. So sometimes people become disabled and move to another country. There's a list of countries that you still get paid by moving to that. There's a list of countries that you cannot get paid. I hope that's helpful, but you really should look up the Canadian requirements for receiving disability benefits and whether you're eligible. Hope that helps. All right, thank you. Let's see. Um, I think that one was kind of answered. Um, there was one, I lost it. It was in the beginning. So um, someone was asking that um, they lost their um, social security hearing. They've been told they have to start over. They're wondering if they're going to lose their work credits. The last time they worked was either 2012 or 2013 and they were paying taxes. This is a wonderful question. Wonderful question. Um, it's technical. It sounds like you had somebody help you. Often, my experience is some of the people that represent you when they lose a hearing will just say to reapply. And there's some things you should know. First, there's a, there's a part of your decision that says date of last insured, DLI. DLI stands for that date when your eligibility runs off for SSDI. So if the last time you worked was 2013 and you worked continuously up to that date, after five years, it ends. So 14, 15, 16, 17, 18. So your disability alleged onset date better be before 2019 or you cannot get SSDI benefits. The further problem is once they decide at a hearing that you're not disabled, you can't jump over that hearing anymore. You can't go prior to that hearing date. So if you just had a decision in 2020 your date of last insured is 2018, you can't get it anymore. So your only remedy would be to appeal that decision to the appeals council. And if you go to the appeals council, then after that, this federal court, if you get that overturned, you can have another hearing. The person representing, representing you though should actually explain that to you. Uh, if you look at the decision, it says that date of last insured. And if your hearing is after that, it's a big problem. It's a really big problem. Sometimes the only remedy is to appeal it and try to flip that decision. But that is a serious uh, moment in your application for disability is what do you appeal or you, do you uh, apply again? If I, if I saw your uh, decision, I could tell you, I could go through it with you, but it's, it is technical. Thank you, Dave. Um, here's another one. I'm now 38. I've been out of work um, since 2016. I previously applied for disability in 2017 and was rejected and told I should just work at a desk next to a bathroom. I was told that because I only worked full time for eight years at a minimum wage job that I wasn't eligible for any assistance. How do I get protections provided by disability even if I don't qualify for financial benefits? Disability is not going to provide you any help unless you actually get disability determination and get benefits. You know, it sounds, the, the initial question though is, are you disabled? I get that all the time. People And the symptoms, I don't know what your symptoms are, but I'm just saying typically people that need frequent bathroom, unscheduled bathroom breaks, IBS, some kind of uh, GI issues, some kind of bladder issues. Um, that's That's a legitimate way to become disabled because... A lot of employers won't let you do that if you have too many breaks or too long of a break. And I don't know when your determination was, if it's the, at the initial determination, vast majority are denied at that level. And I'm winning those only at hearing levels, the IBS and the other issues, because you need frequent bathroom breaks 
for any issue, but it's a judgment call. Um, I wouldn't necessarily agree to say that you're not disabled. You, st you could very well be disabled. Sometimes you have an accommodating employer, you're working less than full time and they let you take frequent unscheduled breaks. But I find that at hearings, if I can prove frequent unscheduled breaks, that's a finding of disability. So that's my response is you, you might really be disabled depending on your condition. Thank you. Um, someone's asking that um, they have had no income since 2018. They were forced to resign from their job, but they live with their retired father who's on a fixed income. Is his income technically my income? I'm assuming she means when she's applying for disability. Does she have to sure. claim his income because she lives with him? That's a good question. So if you work continuously up to 2018, his income doesn't make any difference. And in fact, a spouse's income wouldn't make any difference. With Social Security Disability Insurance, because you've worked for it, all that matters is if you yourself have had wages, just wages. So you can have a spouse that's making a ton of money. You could have technically won the lottery and still get disability because it's not wages. You can have saved a significant amount of money. So no one else's income is a factor. Um, and even with SSI supplemental security income, that is not that is not a factor either if you're living with him. So I would I would say no, that wouldn't make any difference with your application. That's great information. Um, you answered this a little bit about agencies you'd recommend, but someone's asking about the costs associated with working with a service like what you provide in Wisconsin. Oh, great, great question. Thank you. I should have brought that up. With, with Social Security as a system, they suggest that representatives help them, either certified reps or attorneys. And that is, we receive 25% of any past due benefits. And once the decision is made, we don't get any benefits after that. So for example, you apply, you get a year of retroactive benefits. Social Security would award us 25% of that. You get the rest of that, and from that point on, you get all of it. So they they restricted further that if you get more than twenty four thousand dollars of benefits up to a hearing, we don't get any twenty five percent above that. So the max people get is six thousand up to a hearing. After a hearing, if you we appeal it to the appeals council, that goes gets overturned and come back down, they take off the six thousand cap, and it's just twenty five percent. So the rule of thumb is you don't pay unless you actually receive benefits. It's 25% uh, cap. And we don't charge for costs and things unless people actually get benefits. So people never get any benefits. They don't owe us anything at all. Wow, that's really actually great to know. I think some people don't probably didn't realize that. And is that something commonplace in every state? Like, is that something that's kind of set up by the government so that like Wisconsin can't say do their own thing? That's set up by the Social Security guidelines and they let people in other states put any any caps on that or restrict it further. That's just the general Social Security guidelines. And that's what generally Wisconsin follows. I'm not sure about all the other states, how they do that. But they can't loosen it is what you're saying. They can only restrict it further. Correct, that's correct. Okay, okay, great, thank you. Okay, so let's see. Um, um, this person wants to know about the process for getting um, SSD for your child once they turn 18. Um, so they tried to file, but they were not approved because of their income, because she I'm assuming she's not quite 18 yet. She can't go to school, she can't work, and she can't get a driver's license. So they want to know how to get her on SSD by the time she turns 18. Yeah, there's two there's two kinds of Social Security. One's for children, one's for adults. The adult starts at 18. So there has to be a new application when they turn 18, even if they've been on disability prior to that. They'll, they'll, they'll terminate children's benefits and you have to apply for adult benefits because the standards are different for adults, if that answers the question. 
I think I think that does. Yeah, you have to you have to have a new application, and there could be SSI benefits or SSDI benefits. It's just a little tricky, but yeah, th they should apply after the age of eighteen. Okay, thank you. Um, what if your child's age five is the one who's disabled but needs constant care? They can't go to school, so that might actually kind of be related to the the previous question. So they can apply for it as a for them as a child. Yes, as children's benefits, and then there's there's an eligibility requirement because really it's an SSI uh, benefit for the child. So there's a there's a family asset and income test for that. So that kind of condition certainly seems like they'd be eligible for benefits, but the only way to find out about the eligibility is to actually apply to determine if they're eligible. Great, thank you. Could the same requirements apply to getting disability while serving in the military? I think the question is, can you receive both veterans benefits and social security disability benefits? Because certainly if you're serving in the military and receiving wages and stuff, you're not gonna be disabled under social security rules, but with service related disability benefits, they do not count toward that $1,310 income limit. So if it's a service related disability, you can get that disability monthly payment plus social security disability. Now, veterans disability determines benefits completely different than Social Security. They can do they can do um, parts, percentages. Social Security, it's all or nothing. Either you're disabled or you're not. And in veterans benefits, you can get 10%, you know, 30%, you get different body parts, different function. But the general rule is if it's service related you can apply and perhaps get social security disability benefits on top of that. Okay, thank you for that answer. I think the way, what you said is probably what they meant in their question. Um, this one says, if I'm at the federal level, would it be best to keep going or start a new claim after three years? Uh, this is another great question. This is a great question. Um, the Social Security system technically ends at the appeals council level. That's one step above the, the hearing level. And when you appeal it to the federal court, you can file a new application while your case is still pending in federal court. So we do that. So you have a claim with the federal attorneys that they can take over a year, year and a half. So what you do is you file a new application, just like you did the first one. Your onset date is not prior to the decision from your hearing. And you can see if you can get someone disabled at that initial or the next step level. And the benefits, one, they'll get benefits, monthly benefits earlier. And two, if you get that decision flipped, the federal judges say that decision is wrong. You gotta go back and do your second hearing. They'll join those two together and often what I'm finding is judges are thinking now, well, they decided you're disabled on your second application. So now let's see how far we can go back. So we, we encourage people to do that second application. There's a lot of advantages for it. The disadvantages is it's, it's a lot of fuss. It's more work. It's more to keep track of, but really there's, there's a ton of benefits in doing it. I don't know how many people are actually doing it, but I think it's a great thing to do. It's definitely some good advice, I think, for people that are going through that process. It's so long. It takes so long. Uh, we had a couple of hearings that we won finally. Both They were just over nine and a half, almost 10 years each. So this one I applied in uh, 2011. I did five hearings and we finally won it at the fifth hearing. That's sometimes you just have to do that. You just have to be really, really persistent. That's really unusual, but Social Security has its own timetable. It doesn't necessarily go quickly. Yes, I am sure. 
If you're eligible for SSI, can you eventually get Medicare? Yes, you can. You can get Medicare by working a little bit. Um, so this is how that works. You can make $1,310 in a calendar month. With SSI, the more you make, the less you actually get. But if you work part-time making wages, you could still earn credits toward SSDI, full technical. Um, so by working a little bit, let's say three or $400 a month, you could be earning credits so that eventually you're eligible for SSDI and therefore get Medicare. It's tricky though, because it's usually it's a long haul of, of uh, becoming eligible. So for example, in this year, for every $1,470 you make, you get one credit. You get a maximum of four credits a year. You need 20 credits over a 10 year span to become eligible. That's a little technical, but essentially, yes, you can do that if you work part time over a long period of time. Okay, good to know. Uh, I think you may have answered this in the beginning, but maybe this person missed it or other people missed it. What if you've never had a job? So then you're you're eligible for SSI typically because you're poor, little income, little assets. That's one way to become eligible. Another way to be eligible if um, you're disabled before the age of 22, maybe at a parent. And the third way you can become eligible is widow benefits. Widow benefits mean that you are married at least 10 years. You're disabled after the age of 50. You're not been remarried from the person that you were married for for 10 years. And your disability started within seven years of the date of that death of the spouse. You could become, get benefits on widow benefits. How's that for an answer? <laughs> <laughs> it's definitely a, a complicated one, that's for sure. That is for sure. Um, this is actually, I think, a good question that I'm not sure you covered. Um, so this person receives SSD now. How often does a Social Security check to see if you are still disabled? That is a good question. So the rule of thumb is like three, five, and seven years. That's the rule. Um, sometimes you get in decisions from hearings, they say a year. So they set up this system. That's what we're finding, three, five, or seven years. And, and they determine when to review it based on a few factors. The general rule of thumb is the older you are, the less likely they will review you. The younger you are, the more likely they are. Um, the the more obvious the symptoms and the records, if you've had surgeries and um, fusions and complications, it's less likely that they're going to uh, review you. But let me just talk about the review process real quick. You can, you'll receive a letter that says, I want to review you, which basically means give us an authorization where you get all your records and fill out an adult function report. And if you're working part-time, fill out another report. They'll get those and decide if you're disabled or not. If they decide you're not disabled anymore, you can appeal that and it goes through the same process. But even better, you can get paid while that's being appealed, but there's a catch. And the catch is you gotta appeal right away. You got like a 10 day appeal time. Everything else in Social Security is 30 or 60 days. But if you appeal within a tight time frame, you can get appealed while, I mean, you get paid while that appeal goes on, which could be a year or two. So the rule of thumb is you got to look at all the stuff that comes in the mail and really look at it and see if you should respond or not. 
And our rule of thumb is you can't be, you can't assume that Social Security gets what you send them. So always keep proof of what you've sent to them and when you've sent it. Especially nowadays, it's getting really choppy out there. People are working from homes and that regular documentation is more difficult. You can't just stop in an office and get a stamped filed copy. So just pay attention to those things um, in terms of if you get denied so that the appeal, maybe you can get paid during that time. That's good advice. I I think just in general, don't always assume people get what you send them <laughs> is definitely good advice, especially in these situations. Um, I know we're getting a little low on time, so I have just maybe two more questions for you. Sure. One, do you have anybody that you've worked with that has gotten disability for only a CVS diagnosis, a cyclic vomiting syndrome diagnosis with no other um, disability issues? Well, I've, usually what I've done with CVS is they've had some companion diagnosis and the um, CVS is kind of the symptoms. You know what I'm saying? So typically um, there's some, I'm trying to remember the ones I've done. I don't think it's ever been like idiopathic. It's always been related to something. Like say anxiety or depression or something like that? Yeah, usually it's, the ones I've done is physical. Um, I've, I've done the cannabis. I've seen that come through. Um, but usually it's, uh, it's physical and the physical diagnosis itself doesn't make it disabling, but the symptoms from CVS makes it disabling. And usually the, the treating docs and professionals have been really good about documenting that. So, so it's all so in that situation, it's really the documentation is super important. All it's all about function and documentation. Usually, uh, people have great treating people, and they'll write up something, and the person doing the adult function report says, "Yeah, these are my symptoms. This is how often it's happening. Nausea, vertigo, whatever it is," and that's really helpful. Function. Okay. Yeah. For sure. All right. One last question. Can Social Security deny for cannabis use if medical marijuana is legal in your state and you have a card? My daughter uses uh, cannabis to control nausea and anxiety. Yeah, this is a good this is a good question because in Wisconsin, of course, it's not legal. And the first let's address Wisconsin. I'm finding, though, that the judges are letting it go. Technically, it is a question. But I'm finding that's Five years ago, it was just terrible. Judges were just denying it for use, even if it wasn't related to any disability impairments. You know, if you've had some crippling reflex sympathetic dystrophy and uh, on limbs and you're not doing much and you're uh, using marijuana, it's not gonna make any difference. Um, some judges thought if you had anxiety or using it, that doesn't make sense. So they were denied on that. But lately, I found the last year or two, judges just aren't inquiring into it. They're letting it go. It's not an impediment. It's the harder drugs that are doing it. The regular alcohol use, meth, molly, cocaine, injectables, those things are, are preventing it. But the marijuana use is not. As to other states, just anecdotally talking to people, they're letting... The judges are letting it go. They're saying it's okay, especially if there's medical treatment. You're seeing a doc. The doc says, yeah, you can do that. They're letting it go. It's not an impediment to getting disability. But it, it, it's helpful just so the doctor says, yeah, that's, that's, um, that's okay. When you have doctors saying, I want you to stop, then that's a problem. That makes perfect sense. Thank you for that. I think that's definitely going to be a question for a lot of people. Okay, one more really quick question that I happen yeah, to I see at the end. I think sure. I know the answer, but I'm going to ask you, is CVS in the blue book for SSDI? That's a good question. I have not seen it. I have not seen it, uh, CVS in the, in the blue book. I believe it's not based on, we had a social security 
um, representative write an article for our newsletter. Um, if the person asking that wants to send an email to the office, I can send you that. But they, in the article, they talk about how you have to relate it to something as close to CVS as you can. So I, at least at that time when the person wrote the article a couple of years ago, I believe it was not in the blue book. Yeah, and I'm the not last sure. Time, yeah, and I last time I looked, I did not see it. I don't have any current cases. What I do when I get a current one, I look up the most recent. And the last time I did, I did not see any, uh, like fibromyalgia has a checklist. Right. And some of the other ones that are a little more fatigue, autoimmune, but I don't see a checklist. And when I've gone through other sites, the other uh, big national guys have their question and answers. And I look at theirs and they're just doing by symptoms too. I don't see any specific regulations on them. So my guess is probably not. But I yeah. can always look it up for somebody. They can always contact me. I can, I can check to see if it is. Okay. Well, Dave, thank you so much. This is... Um... I think been a really great informative presentation for especially our adult population, um, but kids too. Um, so we really appreciate it. And thank you everybody for joining us. The recording will be out on the YouTube channel. It usually takes us about a week to get it um, all edited down if we need to and taken care of. So thank you so much, everybody have a great day. Thanks for all your good work. Take care. Thanks, you as well.